you for joining us today for Safe Tech Solutions here in Worcester, Massachusetts. We're so very grateful to WCCA TV for inviting us in to have this time with you today. In the first three episodes that we recorded, we walked everybody through what the biological risks are with wireless technology, including our own devices, cell towers, small cells, smart meters, and satellites and other infrastructure that's going in. So we hope you'll have a chance to look at those three episodes to understand the basic facts, what is happening in the public policy arena, and also what is happening through the courts. Today, I'm very excited to bring in citizens who are in their communities right now working on safe technology. Here with me in the studio, I'm delighted to introduce Lori Woden. Hello. Hi, Hello. Lori. And Lori comes to us from Upton, Massachusetts. Uh, Lori, do you want to say a few words about how you came to learn about wireless technology risks? Uh, it began with a friend of mine who was very affected by it. When she went back to work at her nonprofit after COVID, they had changed the entire infrastructure there and everything was wireless. And mm -hmm. she became sicker day by day by day. She happened to be pregnant at the time. It ended up in a miscarriage, and she was unable to c continue working there. And so she, it's very difficult to find an environment you can work in now mm -hmm. and has not been able to work and would very much like to. And then I became aware of more people, and I have some sensitivity to it a little bit myself as well. Mm -hmm. I was a library media teacher for a long time, so I worked in labs, and I worked uh, around a lot of computers and had no idea that there was any danger. But I've come to understand that now. Yeah, it's shocking just how much science is really out there showing us the facts. And once we know a little bit, we can simply choose to hardwire our technology. It's not rocket science, as we discussed in an earlier episode. You just plug in an Ethernet cable to your router, and then you can run little adapters off of that and plug it right into your device and then just go into the devices and disable each one of the antennas, the Wi-Fi, the Bluetooth, the data, the locator, the hotspot, the cellular. And for anyone who didn't know any better and upgraded to a 5G device, you want to go in and turn those antennas off. And the good news is you get a far superior connection when you're running it through cables um, wireless has just kind of been thrust upon us with no information on the choices that we do have for safe technology. So also with us today, I'm excited to welcome Nina Anderson, who is the president of the Scientific Alliance for Education. And Nina is such an inspiration on many levels. First, she's a retired corporate pilot. So think about that for a second. Probably one of the first women pilots in general and then to be a commercial pilot for an entire career, it just, it just blows me away. But Nina also has been very involved in her community and with environmental toxins over the years. So Nina, we're going to welcome you by Zoom from Sheffield, Massachusetts. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with wireless safety. Hello. Thanks, Cece. Um, yeah, um, we, we started the Scientific Alliance for Education, which you are part of now. Um, back in the 90s because we're fighting cell towers in our local area and it, it was, you know, a big education thing. We had a war against that, whatever. So we've been doing a wireless technology for a long time. Um, I got involved in it primarily um, because, you know, of the, the harm that we found. Um, we wrote a book uh, on it. Um, uh, we were with... Um, well, I have I had a book called The Cell Towers, Wireless uh, Convenience or Environmental Hazard that we published because I have a publishing company uh, that Blake Levitt wrote. And so, we, you know, we got, you know, really up to speed on the whole thing. We uh, took it to aviation, too. Right now, I'm trying to educate um, the pilots. I work for the FAA doing uh, seminars, and um, we're, I'm trying to educate people on the fact that you know, you're sitting in the cockpit and you got all this 5G and all this uh, wireless technology in there. And if your brain goes on vacation at the wrong time, that could not be a really good thing. So we're trying to trying to educate them too, to say that maybe, you know, a lot of the pilot error things that we're showing up in, in accidents and incidents are because their brains are going on vacation because of the wireless. Of an article that was published last summer in Professional Pilot Magazine and it addresses 5G, but also, as you say, 
the um, impact on the brain for the pilots and the crew and everybody else in the plane. So for anybody who'd like a copy of Nina's article, I take it with me every time I fly now and I make sure I hand a copy to the captain and the crew. <laughs> and some of them are interested. And I pay attention. <laughs> yeah, and well, at the end of the flight before I leave, because I don't want them distracted during the flight, right? Okay. Um, but if folks would like to have a copy of that article and do the same, please join us at Massachusetts for Safe Technology. That's M-A, the number four, safetech.org. And if you go to our resources page, you will find Nina's article there. You will also find an art or a letter that you can print out for the medical conference because most of our doctors and nurses and firefighters have not been trained to recognize microwave sicknesses when they see them. So you'll also find a letter for your doctors on our resources page. And back in 2004, the International Association of Firefighters actually put up a position statement on the IAFF website, and it's still there today, saying that we do not consent to cell towers on or near our stations due to the science that is showing harm, but also because there have been firefighters who have been harmed and they've suffered brain, um, brain damage from those high powered frequencies going into and through their fire station. So lots of good resources for our audience at Massachusetts for Safe Technology. And um, Nina, let's start with you to talk about what you're doing today to try and protect the towns of Sheffield and Great Barrington from these toxic cell tower installations that are coming closer and closer to where we live, where we go to school, where we work, where we play. What are you doing out in Sheffield? We're not focusing so much on the cell towers right now. We're focusing on 5G because people think, oh, wow, you know, you have to have a faster download. Wow, this is a really big thing. So everybody wants 5G. It's not about making a phone call. As you know, it's about you know, faster downloads, a little more inconvenience, but at what cost? That's what we're trying to tell people. So we were successful in getting warrants on both Great Barrington and Sheffield's town meetings on May 1st for a vote. And basically the warrant is is conditional. It's not saying, hey, we got to get rid of this because, you know, we don't want to have that fight right now. But we are telling the, uh, the, the warrant does say, look, the FCC in 2021 was given 11,000 pages of harm. OK, uh, by Environmental Health Trust. And they ignored it. Two years, they've ignored it. And it really was all scientific and said, look, this 5G technology, especially the millimeter waves, the short waves, um, are really harmful to especially pollinators and the environment and people. And maybe we ought to look at this before we uh, endorse it. Well, they've ignored it. So our warrants basically say we don't want to be guinea pigs until the FCC figures it out and figures out if this is this is actually safe and um, responds to the court order that they were given. We don't want to be big guinea pigs. We just want to not take any applications for small cells. There are some already in the police stations and places like that, but those I don't think are the millimeter waves because they have to go longer distances and the millimeter waves only go like maybe 300 feet, maybe a quarter of a mile at most. And so I think the, uh, the uh, emergency services have to use the, the 5G that's more like a 4G wave. So we're, you know, that's what our warrants are. We've been successful with the citizen petition, getting them on both towns. We're doing a lot of outreach. We've done a, um, uh, we had uh, last month, we had um, a seminar at, in Sheffield at the library and we had 50 people come. And they sign petitions and they're all rah, rah, yes. And now we're doing one in Great Barrington next Thursday on the 20th at the Friends Meeting House. And we're going to hopefully get a lot of the Great Barrington people there so that we can educate them on the fact that they do have to vote yes on this warrant. So that at least it'll buy us time to be able to really uh, put this fight into full force. Well, that's just an amazing inspiration for other towns. And when we announced that you guys were doing that, uh, Lori Woden from Upton thought that sounded like a pretty good, moderate way to go into your town, not to say, oh, we got to get rid of technology, because nobody's ever going to do that. We love our technology, but we do want to make sure it's in the best interest of public safety. So, Lori, can you tell us a bit about what you've been doing in Upton? 
We began by asking the planning board to update the zoning bylaws, and we were trying to put something about small cell antennas in there and also get setbacks because we know that there is a small need for this wireless technology for emergency services and phone calls, but we also know that we already have a very good infrastructure with 4G, which is always going to be what's going to deliver our internet. Mm -hmm. So people notice that with 5G, 4G is not going away. That's still the key way that we get internet, and that's very extremely important. And so we want to get setbacks from schools and homes and playgrounds, daycares, senior housing, that sort of place. And there wasn't enough time to get that done. Okay. And so we thought, we need to have a holding pattern. And we saw Sheffield and Great Barrington's, and we said that would work for us too. We'd like to put a pause on new installations so that we can study it a little bit more locally because if the FCC is refusing to do what the courts have mandated it to do, we can study it. There's so much information out there that's easy to access. So, we, so we're asking for this pause <clears throat> at town meeting. On, ours is on May 4th. You know, down the road, they can come back and do something different, but we would just like a little bit of time to study a little bit more and decide as a town how we want to go forward. Do we want to update the bylaw? Do we want to put in setbacks? What makes sense? Do we want to find out what actually is the infrastructure that we need? Because a lot of towns are being told they need a great deal more than they do because there's financial incentive for the infrastructure companies that build the cell towers and make the antennas and also for the telecom companies. And we don't really want to have more infrastructure than we need. I've talked with our police and fire chief who sort of intimated that that may be the case. And we'd like to have minimal infrastructure to get the maximum we need. We're also hoping to amend our town meeting article for parts of town where there was little or no cell service. Because we know that's a safety issue. We need to have it. But we want to really find out what do we need? And we'd like to go forward in that way with this pause. Right. And when we were speaking with your chief of police and fire, um, one subject that came up was the industry has been telling us they need more capacity. So they want to spin up 5G. They want to put it in our community. So they're kind of pushing the market for this. It's not like we ever woke up and said, I need to have a download in two seconds instead of six seconds, right? This is just their marketing. And 5G is a marketing term. It's not universally defined. Each company blends different frequencies from the 3G spectrum, the 4G, and now these little millimeter waves. And so there is no definition. And as Lori indicated, um, Computer World and others have done stories that said, we're not even getting faster speeds with 5G. 4G was just fine. And not that, not that wireless technology is ever going to be safe, because there's no safe level of microwave radiation in the scientific literature. But we don't need 5G. The industry would like us to have 5G, because that's their new revenue stream, right? Um, but they're also, you know, as they push in all the streaming they're also buying up the entertainment industry. So, you know, they're clever. They're building out their portfolio of business lines. So we need to be able to, in our towns, to differentiate between what is good for the town versus what's good for these wireless companies. So with the fire chief, we started talking about the ability to make an emergency phone call. And if we have our landlines, we can do that. But the industry came in and started convincing our towns, you know, innovation, newer is better. So let's take all the services for phone, cable, and internet and bundle them all together. And then they don't have to maintain the copper landlines anymore. Because if they can bundle all that wiring together and run it to your house, then that sounded like a pretty good idea for most of our towns. But what they didn't realize the trade-off was, is we live here in the Northeast. And we get bad weather sometimes that takes out our electricity. So if you no longer have a copper landline, you've lost power. And, you know, when my daughter was little, we lost power for 36 hours. But we still had our copper landline. We could still call for an emergency service. So what if you don't have a backup generator? What if you don't have backup batteries and your cell phone is dead? How are you even going to be able to call the fire and the police? So as... Lori said, we just, as a community, need to take a pause and look at the facts 
not the industry selling points, and then find that happy medium between what we need and what they're trying to sell us. And, you know, we can all have amazing technology, but wireless, and especially at a close range, is never going to be the right solution in our towns. And it's a poor solution. A wired solution that we had for a long time is better. Fiber is better. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> they don't, unfortunately, make money with things we already have, so there always has to be something new. Yeah, and we've seen their playbook time and again where they introduce their new excellent services, but then they only deliver them to the places where they can make the most revenue, and it leaves everybody else out without connectivity. So there are still communities that never even got good 4G technology, or um, what the experts are saying today is that we all deserve to have fiber optics to and through the premises or high-speed cable. So they run it right to the premises, and then we just simply hook up from our own router modems indoors with Ethernet cables and little adapters to our devices for a far superior signal. So it's doable, and there's a lot of federal money out there right now for the broadband infrastructure, and what we need to ensure in our towns is that that goes to bringing it right to the premises. So with 5G, if the industry had their way, they would run the fiber optics down the middle of the road, and then they would throw up small cell nodes right on top of that. And literally, people are waking up to a small cell tower right outside their bedroom window. And with your cell phone and with your wearables and with you know all our own personal devices, we can choose to turn that off. But when you have something mounted that close to your home, there's no way that you can get away from it. And the science shows that it's cumulative, like any toxin is, it's cumulative with exposure. So somebody might be all excited to have a 5G signal and they're happy to have that cell tower right there today because they've been told they're gonna to have better speeds and greater capacity. But what happens three months from now, six months from now, a year from now, three years from now, when the classic symptoms of microwave sickness start showing up, the headaches, the nosebleeds, the nausea, the dizziness, anxiety, depression, you know, tinnitus. migraines, the ringing in the ears, the tinnitus, pain from unidentified sources. Um, so we know, we know that this technology is not safe and it has no business being brought in at close range. So we're so very grateful for the programs that you guys are doing in each one of your communities. Um, and I love that everybody's approaching it a little bit differently because there's no one size fits all for everything. So each town is running programs differently. So Nina, do you wanna tell us, kind of sketch out what the town forum was that you guys held earlier in Sheffield? Like I said, we, we, we had a meeting and we've been doing a lot of publicity. The one thing that we're doing in Sheffield, especially, and even Great Barrington, we're playing the agricultural card. Because here, you know, we, we've heard, we know, first of all, 5G, you know, if it rains, 5G is going to be intermittent. Oh, well, we tell people, hey, look, you know, you get 5G in there, it's great, but if it rains, you're not going to be able to talk to anybody. So um, that's that's one of the things, you know, we put doubt in their mind. We have these little buttons that we've been, I don't know if you can see that or not. Yeah, it's a little, little button. We've been handing them out, saying, uh, no 5G, our town, our choice. And um, we actually, with the farmer's market, we were doing a lot of publicity, handing out things at the farmer's market so that people could understand it. But the, um, the big thing in the agriculture is the fact that the 5G is messing up the pollinators. They're getting all messed up. Their, their um, whole body system is getting corrupted. They are either dying or not going back to their hives. The same thing with birds. And, you know, they're having a problem with the navigation from the 5G. And so what we're doing is we're telling the farmers and the, uh, all the we have a huge agricultural community around here with apple growers and, and, and all sorts of plants and, and marijuana. Um, and you're not going to have any pollinators. They have come out. I heard somebody's come out with drone bees. 
So I guess they're saying, well, gee, if we don't have any bees, we'll just buy the drone bees and have them come in and pollinate for us, which is really absurd. But, you know, it shows you the way people are thinking today. But if we don't have the pollinators, our whole economy in this area for agriculture, I mean, from the dairy industry and everything else, is going to suffer. So we're playing that card big time around here to try to get people to understand that this is just not, not our health because they don't like you talk about health. You know, they say, oh, you're a woo-woo person if you tell people that their cell phone's going to give me ear cancer. So we've been just doing a lot of outreach as far as letting them know about the environmental impacts, the impacts on the trees, being able to take the, the, the nutrients from the ground up to the crown, which is, it is also a problem with 4G. And also, you know, the fact that it does, uh, you know, does hurt humans and they're going to be inconvenienced if it rains. So that, that's what we've been basically doing. And the people have been coming out. Like I said, we have 50, 50 people come out. I've had, uh, you know, we have a core group around here besides uh, we're helping with Lennox and we're helping with uh, Pittsfield and their cell tower fights. Um, they're not so focused on 5G. But we're trying to support them because, of course, if they get the cell tower of 5G is the next thing that they're just going to plop on the cell tower. The other thing we're telling people is, um, you know, we're showing the, the picture of the 5G transmitter in front of their house with the spray pattern. And even if they get fiber optic to their house or to the street, I should say, and they put the 5G on there they're going to still get the environmental effects with the bees and with their own, um, you know, health. And people, a lot of people are going, you know, they're really tuned in, they're understanding it. But if they're just sort of married, they walk around with their cell phone here all day long, it, they don't want to know. And they're not going to, you know, you really can't convince everybody, but that's why we're also playing the environmental card. If you say that, hey, look, you're not going to be able to eat anymore, maybe <laughs> pay attention. Yeah, you're right. People come at this from many different angles. And sometimes, you know, the first time we hear it, we've just come through a pandemic and people are very overwhelmed. So we get that and we understand. But this one, even for your own devices, is really pretty easy. Once you know you're halfway there, then you just need to figure out which wires and adapters you need. Um, but when it comes to our towns, most of our town Boards are comprised of volunteers, good doobies who give their time to their town, but they don't really understand any of this, and most of our town attorneys don't understand this either. Uh, there's a really good attorney by the name of Robert Berg, and there's another one, Andrew Campanelli. They both recently participated in an attorney's forum to speak directly to our municipalities, and they say, you know, the industry comes in, they say your hands are tied, you have to be put in cell towers wherever and it's not actually true and they'll say oh you know you're gonna get sued if you don't let us put this cell tower in so the local attorneys will go and look in their systems and say oh my gosh there really are lawsuits happening what they don't see is that the towns that got their bylaws strengthened and put protections in place those never go to court so they're only seeing a small slice of it and it plays into the intimidation by the industry. So um, I also appreciate that you have worked on a book some years past with Blake Levitt and she and scientist Dr. Henry Lai have come out with a series of three really important papers on the environmental impacts to our pollinators, the plants, the, the birds, everything in our biome. And if you go to Massachusetts for Safe Technology and you look on the resources page, you can click on the planetary link and that will show you where all those studies are. So, you know, everything that Nina is saying, everything that Lori is saying is science and fact based. It's just not well known by the public. So, Nina, thank you for sharing that you um, have had success just getting out and looking people in the eye and saying, hey, you know, here's something you might want to know about. One thing I wanted to mention um, that you just you just mentioned about the fact that the, the hands are tied, the town's hands are tied for doing this. We did a lot of research, and we have a paper, and we we have proof, and we send that to the towns, and we say, look, here it is. The FCC says this, and the FCC has this this rule and regulation in it that allows you to decide what's right for your town. And if you don't believe me, here it is, and here's a here's a place you can go. Here's where you can find it. So we do have that paper. If anybody needs that, I think I sent it to Lori, um, you know, that we can let them know that the towns are misguided and they really don't, you know, they're listening to telecom. They're not listening to the law 
and the attorneys aren't looking in the right places to find it and their attorneys are misguided. So that's what we're trying to do is it is clue them in and say, hey, look, this is this is the law. Would you please get up to speed and, and not all data, you know? So Nina, how can people connect with you? Well, they they can they can uh, go to our website. You know, it's a safe helps you dot org. Safe like you store your money and helps you dot org, and that's our website. And, and you're on there too. Um, CC is it is one of our our groups that um, you know we're fighting the battle together. And they can, you know, they can contact us there. Um, my the email, if they ever want to email me, is the same thing. Safe stands for the Scientific Alliance for Education. Safe at BCN Berkshire County Network dot net. Safe at BCN dot net. They can email me. Okay, great, Nina. Thank you so much, and we wish you all the success in the first week of May when Great Barrington and Sheffield go to town vote on this warrant article. And anybody who has friends or loved ones or colleagues in Great Barrington or Sheffield, please share this program with them and ask them to go out and vote and to stay until the vote happens. Oftentimes, these warrant articles are placed at the very end of a long and tiresome night. And so people get up and leave before the vote happens. So we ask that everybody sticks around and uh, participates in their civic duty or civic opportunity to protect their communities. So thank you so much, Nina. And then okay. Lori, can you share with us some of the programs that you've been doing in your community to help get word out? And how did you find people to even sign your petition? Well, there are a number of people who have been supportive and are aware of this in our community. So we were able to get our petition signed by those folks, so it got onto the warrant. And then we had an information session where you spoke, which was wonderful. And um, we're going to have another one on April 28th. The original program that you first did about two weeks ago is on our town's YouTube page. So if you just go to the town of Upton page and click on the little YouTube symbol, you can find it. And then you did an interview on our interview cable show. And so there's more information. And um, as I said, we're going to have a program on the 28th that people can come to. We also created a flyer which has a great deal of information, sort of a learning tool that people can kind of catch up to speed on everything on their own. So we're beginning to email that out to people. We do have an email address, safetechupton at gmail.com if people want to get in touch with us. And um, well, that's, that's we, excellent. We, we also found out that you can, there's an award-winning documentary about all this. It's a few years old, but the information is still quite useful. It's called Generation Zapped, and if your library has it on their Hoopla account, and I think everybody's does, you can get a, uh, the Hoopla app, you can sign up, you can see in the comfort of your own home anytime you want, and get up to speed that way as well. Excellent. So Hoopla or Canopy with your library subscriptions, so that's great. And I want to give Nina and Lori a shout out for being pioneers in this, along with Catherine Levin, who is with us. Uh, the Scientific Alliance for Education. She's their vice president. And she's been working elbow to elbow with Nina out there and doing all these amazing programs. So your leadership has inspired Eileen Duane out in Chester, Massachusetts. And I just got word from her yesterday that they have now accepted a town warrant article in Chester as well. So bravo to everybody who's doing everything they can in their communities. And thank you so much for joining us for Tech Safety here at WCCA in Worcester, Massachusetts. And we look forward to bringing you our next program to discuss the ability to protect your communities from cell towers. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.